This is Dale Morgan welcoming you to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Your host today is James Just with guests John Cameron and Richard Fields. Now, here's James. All right, thank you for joining us today. With me is John Cameron in the middle and Richard Fields on the other end. Okay, gentlemen, we've got, there's a story out here that has tax havens are a good idea. There's a lot of complaints about people uh, not paying taxes or not paying their fair share. But, you know, there's a, there's an idea out there that, you know, not paying taxes isn't necessarily a bad thing. You know, it's uh, our friend, uh, frequent guest on the show, Stephen Greenhut, column in the Orange County Register and elsewhere, uh, where he makes the... Uh, the uh, statistical case that tax havens are actually a, a benefit to humanity, a benefit to to all of us. And and the reason why is really at, at core quite simple. Tax havens make governments be competitive uh, with each other on the uh, efficient delivery of whatever services uh, the people of governments think they need from government. Now, we would argue, of course, that uh, what is the services delivered by government in most cases could be delivered much more efficiently and uh, certainly less in a less costly fashion by a private enterprise. But uh, assuming that governments have to be competitive with each other, it means that if you ha- live in a high-tax jurisdiction, companies and individuals will leave that high tax jurisdiction to set up business or to live in a lower tax jurisdiction, assuming that the benefits are, 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 are the government services are at least adequate. And uh, the, uh, the Janet Yellen and the Biden administration have been going on a concerted uh, campaign to uh, equalize taxes across the board. In other words, they want to make sure that all countries have the same high tax burden that the United States does, make it impossible for people to uh, vote with their feet and go elsewhere to lower their taxes. That's a bad thing. And it's a bad thing simply because uh, it makes it possible for governments to have essentially an oligopoly where they don't have to compete, where they can do whatever they darn well please, tax to their heart's content, uh, spend it to their heart's content, and people have nowhere to go, nowhere to nowhere to run, nowhere to flee, no alternatives. I I agree, and and we're we're already seeing it in the United States. Thank thank goodness for federalism. Uh, we I think all three of us currently live in the state of California, or as I like to call it, Kafka Ornia. And um, we're seeing uh, companies uh, leaving for Texas and uh, other places where they're where the uh, tax rates are lower, um, and uh, the 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 net benefit to their employees of being in a lower tax state and a state with a lower regulatory burden is huge. And so we've seen Tesla move, we've seen HP move. We've seen, we saw Intel, I think it was 15 years ago. I have to look, I'll have to look up the quote when we next touch on this subject where the head of Intel at the time, one of the founders said that uh, we will not add another job in the state of California because they make it impossible to do business here. The tax burden's huge and the regulatory environment is, is not favorable to us. And that's a, you know, and I don't think uh, Intel was actually doing much manufacturing, um, but you know they said flat out uh, California's a problem when we're leaving, and I we've done numerous studies or numerous talks on the show about people leaving uh, state of California in droves. I think state of California had a net its first ever net reduction in population, and you're seeing uh, uh, there there are tons of stories about uh, uh, career bureaucrats, uh, state employees, high level state employees who are retiring out of the state of California, taking their huge pensions. Uh, with them because they don't want to be faced with uh, with the high California state income tax and local taxes. So, you know, the benefit and, and you know, the government, uh, people saying people want to pay their fair share. I would say that a fair share would be a straight percentage for everyone, no matter what their wealth. Um, because if they're getting, you know, let's say you got a billion dollars and you pay 20 percent of that in taxes, not not carry the knot. What is that? A fifth of a billion dollars is two hundred million dollars. I should have been able to do that easier. Um, your your um, 
do you really need, you know, $200 million worth of firefighting and uh, police protection and your contribution to the roads and all the rest of that? No. So it's actually they're paying more than their fair share. And I think Richard's made the point that they get lots of corporate welfare, so they should pay more. And in many cases, that's correct. But the, the, the downside to, to tax burdens is that people live in places like Venezuela and Cuba and um, and all these uh, more obvious police states than the one we live in need somewhere to hide their their money from the theft of the local government, you know, like Venezuela with a hyperinflation. You don't want to put your money in a bank in Venezuela and watch it be worth 10% less, less the next day. You want to put it somewhere where... Uh, you know, it's, it's at least not going to go down in value. So it, it you know, benefits by, by um, again, as Richard stated, by, by forcing um, governments to compete for services. You know, if you provide bad service in a horrible environment for capital and people, then, then they should be able to take their capital somewhere else. Absolutely agree. And there really is no downside. Uh, if it, it should force... Uh, you know, California still has not admitted it has a problem, despite all the surveys that say it's, uh, you know, Sacramento. I live in Sacramento. Uh, it's the worst uh, city in the country to uh, start and run a business. Uh, and, and I think it's kind of proud of that. But, but you know, the, the, the people who are making it that way need to be punished by watching people flee. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, you, you mentioned that, that it's the... Uh, uh, large, you know, Intel and large corporations and Tesla and so forth that are leaving the state. But really, uh, the biggest corporations or the biggest uh, outflux of the businesses are, are the small businesses yeah. uh, who are the biggest employers. And, and James, you were saying? Oh, it's just this. I was I actually forget now. <laughs> I was going to dive into the next topic. But we were speaking about Venezuela. I know recently over the weekend, or they just uh, reduced their currency by six zeros. They just took six zeros off the currency because that'll solve the problem. It's <laughs> to make it simpler, they removed six zeros. And we talk about government efficiency. If government was somewhat efficient, maybe you know taking a fair share would be a you could actually make an argument for people paying more taxes. But they don't. Well, go, go here and look at the U U.S. United States Postal Service. Man, am I having trouble talking today. Has now announced that they are going to reduce service and increase costs to solve their problems. I mean, it's a typical government-type response is we don't actually solve the problems. We're going to rechange the definition of what service is and so we can still meet it while charging you more for it. And it's, it's the same thought process of, well, the, the little guy, the actual customer, can pay more, get less, while the – fat cats in the bureaucracy get fed it's kind of a our world is all upside down what do you guys think oh, well i mean it's another example of a government monopoly and if you really take a look at monopolies i i defy anybody to come up with a, a monopoly that isn't either uh, run by the government, like the post office, as a monopoly, or supported by the government through uh, laws and regulations. Uh, monopolies don't exist in a uh, totally free market. They just don't, because uh, people look at monopoly profits and say, I could uh, compete in that market and uh, make a slightly smaller profit margin and eat the, uh, eat the, the now monopolist lunch. And that's why monopoly doesn't exist unless uh, it's protected by government and or, or owned by government, in effect. Mm -hmm. and, and the post office is a perfect example of that. And what they're doing is absolutely insane. They're saying that they will reduce the uh, time it takes to ship uh, mail from uh, three business days to, th uh, to or two or whatever it was to like three or five, depending on how far it's going. Uh, mainly so that they can use U.S. Postal Service uh, trucks rather than their competitors, FedEx or whatever, uh, airmail services. And they're raising prices substantially at the same time. So, you know, what a great business model. Lower service and increase the price. Can anybody other than a monopoly do that? I don't think so. No, I, I absolutely agree. And and people don't realize how actually how monopolistic the Postal Service is. It's actually illegal uh, for people to deliver a letter by FedEx or all the rest of that. Uh, 
uh, and the Postal Service has inspectors who can actually go into UPS and, and FedEx and open up uh, their parcels to make sure that letters aren't being delivered illegally. Um, and um, so it, it is a true monopoly. And um, we're actually have the ability to, to produce this show uh, because of, of the, the, the monopolistic, I guess it's probably Comcast uh, in this area, is required to um, allow uh, public access on some channels. And um, in order to get its license to have its monopoly, basically here in, in the Sacramento area. So um, I really probably shouldn't bite the hand that puts us on the air, but you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a fact. And, and I agree with Richard that, um, you know, that what, what the government does is, is it, it um, changes the definition of monopoly to suit its own purposes. Like it's calling Apple a monopoly, despite uh, Apple's minuscule share of, of internet search and, and uh, worldwide other than phones, the number of computers it, it has. I mean, it's very popular in coffee houses in California, but if you look at Apple's world, worldwide share of, of computer devices, it's minuscule. How can it possibly be a monopoly? But well, even even with phones, it's uh, it has a lot. There are less Apple phones than there are uh, uh, Android uh, phones out Absolutely. there world, worldwide. Absolutely. Yeah, and so you know you can't you know the, even though I think the most popular uh, phone ever produced was uh, like the iPhone six. No, it isn't. It's actually third or fourth on the list. It was some Androids and some Nokia's and some other things that were top on the list. But despite that, the government says somehow that that uh, Apple has a monopoly. And, uh, you know, when when Apple wanted to raise prices on the books in its uh, bookstore so that authors would be paid more, uh, Amazon, <laughs> Amazon brought suit uh, through, through its, you know, government lackeys saying, well, no, the, uh, Apple's got a monopoly on books, even though Apple's share of book sales was minuscule compared to Amazon's, and and forced um, um, Apple to lower the price it charged for its books. So how can a higher price be be a bad thing for a competitor? Would it, would it be a good thing because people would want to buy books from from Amazon? But apparently, you know, uh, Amazon pulls a lot of weight with the government. Anyway, we probably beat this to death. Everybody knows that monopolies don't exist without either government enforcement, government license, or, or actually if they are government services. And I agree. Yeah. Well, I've worked in a I worked in a factory that had logistic changes, and so you can actually come up for a tour. You can you can actually go to your customer and say, look, we're making some changes, and so for the next six months, three six months, things are going to be a little shaky. We'll give you a bit of a discount. But, you know, so let's expect some problems over the next three to six months while we have us while we're making this change. And that's acceptable. Purple people will accept that. But this notion that we're going to charge you more, give you less and change the definition of what is acceptable service. You know, we never change the definition of what acceptable service is. We told people that we we're likely not going to be able to reach it for the next few months while we're making this change. And, and they were able to accept it. Everybody's able to prepare for it. But instead of now, we've got this bizarre notion where we'll just give you less service, make you pay more for it, and we're going to pat ourselves on the back for doing a great job. It's, <laughs> it's almost, well, it is well, laughable. I'm, I'm very upset with the acceptable level of service I'm, I'm getting from all government entities I deal with. Uh, so they've all been on this, this USPS model for years and just didn't bother to tell us where they're doing a worse job and taking more of our money. Um, you know, and, and sending it off to foreign countries to educate people on stuff that I've never even heard of before. So uh, the post office is just finally admitting what, what the U.S. and state governments have been doing for years. Well, unfortunately, they're not admitting. They're saying we want to be we want to, um, you know, make the post office profitable. Well, they're not for the simple reason that when you lower service and increase prices, business goes down. So it becomes a self-perpetuating vicious circle. They're not going to get more profitable. Uh, their excuse is nonsense and they will uh, continue to fail the same way they have been for the last, I don't know, 200 years, maybe. Yeah. And well, yeah, we'll move on because 
we're speaking of failure and and uh, the refusal to admit mistakes. Marvin Guy has been sitting in jail for seven years awaiting trial in Texas for allegedly cleaning a police officer who was part of a no-knock raid. Who And the officer may have been shot by a fellow officer. And remember, they found no drugs. They found no crime. But yet he's still sitting in jail seven years later, awaiting, still awaiting trial. Yeah, and this is, this is in, in Texas, which has a Castle Doctrine uh, a, a defense. The Castle Doctrine says that you are authorized to use lethal force to repel home invaders. Uh, police knocking down your front door without identifying themselves, breaking windows to get into your house without identifying themselves, are, in fact, home invaders. The police are wrong. Uh, in uh, we're wrong in, in in doing the home invasion in the first place, uh, and the uh, Marvin guy was absolutely within his legal rights to shoot back at home invaders. He didn't know they were police. It was five thirty in the morning. There had been home invasions in the neighborhood uh, in the most in, in the recent past. He had no idea who was who was knocking his door down. Uh, and as soon as he figured out that it was police, he he dropped his gun. He dropped his gun, put his hands up in the air, and surrendered. Uh, the only reason the police are not letting this go is because, well, the, the officer was popular. He was well respected within the police community, at least. Uh, and they don't want to admit they did, did something wrong. That's the problem. And the, the larger problem, of course, is why do we have no-knock raids for search, to search for drugs? Why do we have drug laws in the first place? Those are the root cause. We legalize drugs, no more no-knock rates, everything, you know, this kind of situation uh, no longer uh, pertains, no longer uh, occurs. And I, I just, I, I, I was paying attention. I just looked in and checked out. California actually has a castle doctrine, um, but I, I would, I would challenge anyone to, uh, but I think no-knocks have, have been uh, disallowed in California for quite a while. But, you know, if you're peacefully sleeping at your bed, in your bed at 530 in the morning and someone kicks in your door and you are living in, let's say, a high crime area, uh, your first assumption, uh, and, I, and I think it's a logical one for anyone, is that somebody's trying to break into my house and take my stuff or shoot my family or, or whatever it is, or get even for an imagined slight in this, this, this world of dissing that we, that we have. Um, and so, you know, reaching for your perfectly legal weapon and, uh, uh, you know, trying to repel borders uh, is, is perfectly lawful. And again, I agree with Richard, the root causes are but first no knock warrants for, for any reason whatsoever. It's ludicrous. I mean, why, what would be the purpose of a police officer not identifying themselves when they knock on your door? If they have a warrant and permission to search, then they knock on your door and say, it's the police, uh, we have a warrant, we're coming to search your premises because we think you have illegal drugs. Now there, I agree with Richard that, um, you know, what, what you choose to imbibe or buy or sell should be a personal choice and and not the, the uh, subject of, of rules and regulations by the government. So, you know, there's really no legs for this thing, thing to stand on. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot, it's so murky that the guy could have very well been shot by a police officer. Why wasn't that established? Uh, you know, they take all the weapons and fire them, take the guy's weapon and fire it and can identify with, you know, 99.9% cert certainty, which weapon it came from. Apparently that hasn't been done. So lots and lots and lots of bad things. And, and let's hope this doesn't happen again, that there is a national furor and that, that no-knock warrants are made unconstitutional at the national level. That's what I hope. Yeah, well, no-knock raids is actually a military operation. They're not a policing operation. It's what the military does. And why we're using military tactics for, you know, public policing is bizarre to begin with. And, you know, we add on to all these other things that, you know, that we wouldn't happen if we didn't have the drug war and all these other you know, failures of bureaucracy issues, it's become a just yet another long line of our failures. And here goes another long line of our failures. The FISA courts 
which are, for those of us who are in the libertarian sense, the whole notion of a FISA court itself is, you know, unconscionable. But the FISA courts have been chock full of problems. More than 400 problems were found with just 29 warrants. And this is on top of the problems that the FISA court has already been exposed for having. Uh, what do you think about it, Richard? Well, I mean, foreign intelligent, whatever it is, uh, it, you know, the, the whole FISA court idea was uh, put together with the idea of going after uh, national security risks. And since it's national security, then uh, the uh, court that approves the warrants has to be has to keep it keep you know keep everything secret. Well, when you keep everything secret, it gives the FBI or anybody else that's seeking a FISA court warrant a blank check to say we need a warrant. Our evidence is shoddy. We don't care. The FISA court is handpicked to uh, find people that will automatically just knee jerk. Uh, approved pretty much any warrant, and this has been proven. Uh, it was another government agency, the Office of, uh, I forget, some fe federal agency that did the audit, and they are the people. It's another government agency that did the audit and figured out that uh, most of these warrants, the evidence was lacking or the uh, internal guidelines developed by the FBI to approve the warrant or to, to ask for the warrant uh, wasn't followed. Uh, all kinds of problems with the warrants. I mean, it, it, the you know the the, the whole idea uh, of of FISA court with uh, knee jerk reaction to giving warrants is blatantly in violation of the Fourth Amendment against uh, undue search and seizure. Absolutely, and we saw in the last election um, the the um, a severe abuse for political reasons of the FISA court process going after, I guess it was Trump's son-in-law, uh, because he'd had uh, dealings with, uh, I guess, the Soviet Union and, um, you know, basically the FBI agents that put together or that gave information to the FISA court actually lied. They perjured themselves in order to get the documents through. And it turns out that none of the so-called evidence uh, that they had on, on the uh, gentleman actually existed. It was, uh, and then, you know, it was uh, uh, paraded across the banner of all the newspapers and all the major uh, lamestream media that, you know, Trump had Russian ties and da 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 da, da. Whereas uh, the, the new guy, what's his name, Biden, his, his uh, son has, has ties with foreign governments and, and we don't hear anything about that. So, you know, not only is it bad, but it it, it opens the, the world up for for uh, the kind of chicanery that we used to point fingers at foreign countries and say there's corruption, you know, like what they do in, in the Soviet Union or in China when they, they say, you know, we're taking this billionaire and putting him in prison for corruption and taking all of his money. Well, it's, it, his, his corruption was that he didn't agree with the party line. And, and I, I think we're seeing more and more cases in the United States where that's the reason for a FISA warrant so that you can put somebody in the crosshairs and get them out of your way. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me that we're using the courts are now becoming a tool of politics. It's the next logical stage. If you, if you think politics is you know a moral imperative, then you can do whatever you want, right? That's the whole point, and it's it's the danger. So but we'll move on here again. Fifty a recent study has shown fifty five percent of police killings are misclassified as other causes of death. Which yeah, is this is this is self reported uh, police killings. In other words, the police reporting. You know, if if, if uh, an officer in, is involved in uh, a fatality of a uh, civilian. Uh, the police will report self-report, and it turns out they're not reporting accurately. Fifty-five percent of the uh, uh, deaths involved uh, are not recorded as police-caused uh, or police-inspired or whatever. And you know, again, it's it's uh, the uh, the men in blue covering up for other men in blue and making sure that uh, the publicity that they receive for acting badly, acting uh, in many cases illegally, uh, is never comes to light. And this is data that's notoriously hard to come by because uh, the only way you can get it uh, is by doing a painstaking uh, search on every local police force, every uh, state police force all over the country. 
uh, the data that uh, we're referring to comes from one of the Carolinas, I forget, I think it's North Carolina, and, you know, it just does one state. Uh, is North Carolina measurably uh, better or worse than all the other states? We don't know, but probably it's about the same. Uh, we have a very severe uh, situation where, uh, first of all, police are asked to do things which they should not be asked to do. They're asked to enforce uh, essentially unenforceable drug laws. They're asked to uh, uh, enforce other uh, victimless crime laws, whether it's vice or whatever, gambling, uh, prostitution, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, since they're in a position where they have to enforce, uh, go after behavior that's popular among some element of the, of the public and doesn't hurt anybody uh, directly, uh, they, they, you know, they put themselves in a, into a situation where uh, they, uh, you know, the, will we'll get into altercations with members of the public uh, more than they would if they were going after actual crime. Yeah, and you've got less than two minutes, John. So, no, I I, I agree. And the the you know this the reporting you know, relies on in, in all cases. I mean, there's a standard form. It relies on somebody to ask a question, and the question is asked, "What was the cause of this uh, death?" So, if the word uh, you know that, that this person was shot, you know, if that was the cause of death, it was it was a shooting, unless you actually write in the report, it, there's no default that says, was it police shooting, yes or no, or question or standard reporting. You have to remember to put in, oh, he was shot by a policeman. So if that's not in there, then it's just a standard shooting. You know, if, if somebody's run off the road in a high-speed chase, unless you write in, policeman ran person off road in a high-speed chase, it doesn't show up. So, uh, and and I agree that it's, 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 you know, the numbers are being finagled by people. Um, and what's really bad is, is um, you know, never mind. I was going to go into the racial demographics of it. We don't have time, so maybe we can touch one minute closed by somebody else. I don't know. Yeah. Well, we're talking about a lot today about government and bureaucratic incompetence, but we are not going to be incompetent today. We are going to finish on time. So I want to thank you guys for watching this. I want to thank John and Richard for joining me. And I want to thank everybody else. For uh, I forgot who I was going to thank. But anyway, please remember to love everybody and join us next week. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you, James. I... Thank you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint Show. In Sacramento, Channel 17 on Comcast. Each Thursday at 8 p.m. and each Monday at 5.30 p.m. for the Knuckleheads of Liberty. Also on YouTube, Facebook, and podcasts everywhere. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.